Hey everybody, Happy New Year! This video isn't just about the peptides that have their FDA granted indications like semaglutide, terzepatide, and more, but the more popular friends of the biohacking community, BPC-157, thymusin peptide, CJC-1295, GHKCU, among others who have fallen out of the regulatory limelight and bunkered down into the category of largely unregulated for human use but tried by many with an even greater number of people who just want to learn more, myself included. Keep in mind, none of this is medical advice or legal expertise, just a peptide YouTuber who sifts through the data to strengthen my understanding and hopefully yours as well. The purpose of this is to explain the current legal status of peptides like these because admittedly it can be confusing. Even I have scratched my head a couple times, complexed by their unique, ambiguous placement within an ecosystem of growing interest. I'm going to outline key terminology, what is legal, what is shady, what loopholes exist, and finally where these peptides actually stand stand in the eyes of the US government in 2026. Some of the questions I've asked myself in the past are, how are clinicians actually prescribing some of these when compounding many of them is effectively prohibited? Are these prescribers tied to a different standard that allows them to bypass these regulations? And furthermore, my biggest concern, how are we supposed to learn more about the long-term safety and efficacy of these products if their shunning exists? There's a vicious loop at play in which companies are dissuaded from researching and and developing peptides, likely in large part due to their legal status. As a result, we know less, which drives more hesitancy further placing peptides on the regulatory back burner. It's why you see a lot of newer research conducting literature reviews of older collections of data to summarize that body of research because although these compounds are at the peak of their popularity, their long-term understanding is less incentivized. And who suffers most at the end of the day? The people buying research-only products over the internet who assume all liability when they decide to apply this research to themselves. Now, while the FDA's stance can feel like a moving target, it has opened the doors to curious retail practices that could do more harm than good. Before we get into the legislation, we need to define a few key terms like 503A, 503B, and the infamous Category 2 to piece this all together. Now, before we look at why the FDA has started to target compounding facilities, we have to understand the language they use to draw the lines. In the regulatory world of 2026, it's not all about how well a peptide works. It's about the building where it's made, and I'm not kidding, the literal length of the amino acid chain. First, let's talk about where peptide products are made, 503A versus 503B. 503A is the traditional pharmacy. Think of your local state-licensed compounding pharmacy. These are built for individualized medicine. They can't mass produce a peptide. They legally require a patient-specific prescription to get going. 503B is more along the lines of the outsourcing facility. These are the heavy hitters, large FDA-registered labs that can produce massive batches for office use in clinics without needing an individual name on each vial. Because they operate at scale, they have to play by CGMP, or current good manufacturing practice, which is the same high-level federal standard used by big pharmaceutical companies. Next is the bulks list, which is pretty much a permission slip. A pharmacy can't just buy a bag of CJC-1295 powder from a random supplier and start sifting it into vials. They can only compound bulk drug substances that the FDA has given a green light to. If a peptide isn't on the official 503A or 503B bulk lists, it's effectively treated as an unapproved new drug for compounding purposes. And this is where that vicious loop I mentioned earlier gets its teeth. Because to get on this list, the FDA often demands clinical trial data that these non-patentable molecules don't have at this point in time. Whether they're newer products or older ones, seeing a contemporary resurgence. Then there's the red light, officially known as Category 2. This is where most of the players we'll discuss stand. When granted this designation, the FDA is flagging the substance for significant safety concerns or unresolved risk, often citing immunogenicity, the risk of your body deciding the peptide as a foreign invader and mounting an immune response. Once a compound is in Category 2, the door is effectively slammed shut. No pharmacy 503A or 503B can legally compound it for human use. This this is officially the banned zone that has had people within the space scrambling since the fall of 2023. And finally, we must address the 40 amino acid rule. The FDA uses essentially a yardstick to determine if a molecule is a drug or a biologic. If it's 40 amino acids or fewer, it's considered a peptide. If it's 41 or more, it's treated as a biologic. Why does this matter? Because by law, your traditional 503A pharmacy is prohibited from compounding biologics. This is why tessamorelin, which 
which sits at 44 amino acids, is currently stuck in a compounding purgatory in a way. It's simply too long for the local pharmacy to legally touch. Now we must look at the compounds that sit on the category 2 list because this is the core of their developmental ambiguity. I'll read straight from the FDA website. These substances were nominated with sufficient supporting information to permit FDA to evaluate them, and they may be eligible for inclusion on the 503B bulk list. However, FDA has identified significant safety risks relating to the use of these substances and compounding pending further evaluation and therefore does not intend to adopt the policy described for the substances in Category 1. If FDA adds a substance to Category 2, it will publish safety information describing the risks on FDA.gov and advise that the substance has been added to Category 2 and is not within the scope of the policies regarding substances in Category 1. The initial regulatory crackdown came in September 2023, when many peptides were placed on the Category 2 list largely due to safety, immunogenicity, and manufacturing-related concerns, with the FDA outlining specific mechanistic risks for certain compounds. The peptides I've covered in deep dives on my channel that landed on this list include BPC-157, LL37, dihexaacetate, DSIP, epitalon, GHRP2, GHRP6, ibutamarin or MK677, technically a non-peptide, ipamorelin, kispeptin, KPV, melanotan-2, MOTC, thymosin beta-4, fragment 17-23, GHKCU for injectable routes of administration, AOD-9604, CJC-1295, thymosin alpha-1, and Solanc. A year later, in September 2024, several of these compounds were reconsidered and referred to the Pharmacy Compounding Advisory Committee, or PCAC. Solanc was pulled from consideration because its nominator intended to discuss a different drug altogether. The remaining compounds, AOD-9604, CJC-1295, thymosin alpha-1, and ipamorelin, were evaluated by PCAC, which voted overwhelmingly against their removal from Category 2. AOD-9604 and ipamorelin were rejected unanimously, CJC-1295 was rejected in all forms, and thymosin alpha-1 failed by a 4-17 to vote. Which brings us to the present day, where there's a growing sentiment of potential change, particularly in light of leadership shifts within the Department of Health and Human Services and the personal interests of prominent political figures in peptides. On November 10th, 2025, Representative Diana Harshbarger, who keep in mind is a pharmacist herself, sent a formal letter to HHS leadership, including RFK Jr. She wasn't just asking for a favor, she was calling out what she described as redundant and ineffective regulations that are keeping these molecules out of the hands of the people who could arguably benefit from them. The core of Harshbarger's argument is that the FDA is using the wrong metrics to determine availability. She argues that because compounded medications are inherently individualized, they shouldn't be forced through the same multi-billion dollar clinical trial models as mass manufactured blockbuster drugs. In the letter, she explicitly urged the FDA to reevaluate the big six peptides in a way, BPC-157, CJC-1295, ipamorelin, thymosin alpha-1, thymosin beta-4, and GHKCU. She wants the PCAC to prioritize safety and quality over clinical efficacy. Her logic is, if the molecule has a documented safety profile and the pharmacy is using GMP compliant raw materials, let the doctor and the patient decide if it's effective for their specific case. Crucially, she warned that by restricting access through licensed regulated pharmacies, the government's effectively subsidizing the unregulated gray market. It's the vicious loop in legal writing. When you ban the safe source, you don't kill the demand, you just make the supply more dangerous. On the opposing side, it's worth acknowledging that if you look at the FDA's recent warning letters, enforcement has increasingly focused on compounding facilities themselves. Several well-known pharmacies have been cited for insanitary conditions, microbial contamination risks, poor sterilization practices, and inadequate environmental monitoring. And it's quite likely you've heard about RADFEST, a popular longevity conference, where this past year, two people were critically hospitalized after receiving peptide injections. While it remains unclear which peptide was administered or what sterility standards were followed, the incident became a flashpoint for regulators. Which leads us to the legal loophole that confuses many people today. Technically, many peptides are compound restricted, meaning pharmacies cannot legally compound or dispense them for human use. It's why you see these products sold online as for research use only despite being marketed to everyday consumers. This practice is often referred to as regulatory arbitrage or legal fiction. Point being, if someone claims they're being prescribed BPC-157 or similar compounds, that prescription's not being filled by a law 
lawful compounding pharmacy. Either the provider is operating outside of regulatory boundaries or directing people to a research-only vendor. And if someone injects a research-only compound and experiences harm, the medical liability largely falls on the individual who knowingly used a non-approved substance. On the flip side, FDA-approved peptides present their own complexity. Tessamorolin, for example, is FDA-approved for HIV-associated lipodystrophy but classified as a biologic due to its length. It can be prescribed off-label only as its branded product eGrifta, often at extreme out-of-pocket costs. Shorter FDA-approved peptides like PT-141 can be prescribed off-label through approved pharmacies because they meet peptide criteria, have passed FDA safety review, and are not Category 2 substances. Other cases remain murky. For example, afomelanotide approved as Sinesse is a monthly implant administered only by trained professionals for the primary purpose of erythropoietic protoporphyria, or EPP. Reformulating afomelanotide into injectable vials for off-label use would almost certainly fall outside legal boundaries. Sermoralin, on the other hand, sits in a unique position too. It's a 29 amino acid GHRH analog approved decades ago and withdrawn for non-safety reasons. It's not on the category 2 list and remains one of the few peptides with meaningful regulatory flexibility. And it's worth noting that GHKC use sits in a similar middle ground. While it's strictly prohibited for injectable routes, it's still technically allowed for topical or cosmetic compounding. Right now, we're stuck in a game of high stakes regulatory chicken. On one side, you have the 2024 PCAC votes that unanimous wall of data that says these compounds aren't ready for primetime compounding. They're prioritizing a standard of evidence that these non-patentable molecules just can't meet. On the other hand, you have the Harshbarger and RFK Jr. camp arguing that the shunning is exactly what creates the risk. By blocking the regulated path, you're essentially subsidizing the gray market and the legal fiction of research sites. It's a push to move the goalposts from billion dollar clinical trials towards a more practical safety first model. As for me, I'll stick to my scaredy cat roots. Until that loop's broken, until we have more long-term human data and better manufacturing oversight, I think it's critical to stay objective. The status of these peptides is shifting quite fast. I'll keep tracking the filings as 2026 unfolds. If this breakdown helped clarify the mess, feel free to hammer that subscribe button. The best way to help me out if you haven't already is a like and subscribe. And if you're looking for another way to support the channel, I will link my Patreon below. It's a growing community. You can check it out. If you're interested, happy to have you. But most importantly, I appreciate the time. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.